All right. We're about ready to, to get started. It's a beautiful day out there, and it's, it's, um, it's inviting me to go do some yard work. <laughs> oh, don't ruin us, Sunday. Yeah, well... Jesus is in the absolutely, absolutely. I, it reminds me to be thankful that I actually own a piece of dirt. My parents never did, so uh, to own a piece of dirt is is a, a real blessing. Um, all right, so we've been talking about reading Scripture the way Jesus wants us to. And the overall thing that Jesus says about Scripture is it's all about him. Moses is writing about me. You search it looking for a key to life. It's talking about me, but you won't come to me and have life. Right? Jesus says Scripture is about me. You, you've got to read it about me. Last week, we looked at the comments of Paul, which are very explicit in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, is it, where he says, Look, when people are reading the Old Testament, there's a veil over their face, over their understanding. It's like they're veiled. And then only in Christ is that veil removed. What's Peter, or well, what's Paul saying? He's saying the exact same thing. And he's not saying it's a problem with these Jewish people trying to read the Old Testament. He's saying it's a problem with anyone who tries to read the Old Testament scriptures apart from Christ. They've got a veil, they're just covered. Right? And they can't understand it. He says, only in Christ is that veil removed. Right? So he's explicit about the same struggles we have. It's like, well, what do I do with that Old Testament <laughs> passage? Paul says, if you're trying to read it apart from interpreting it in light of Christ, it will be absolutely veiled to you. And you'll struggle. You'll struggle to make sense of it. Okay, so we looked at that explicitly um, in in. I think Paul's lengthy allegory that he makes about Moses having to cover his face because of the glory of having been on Sinai, he turns that into an allegory uh, about why we can't read the Old Testament scriptures clearly. And so he says, yeah, you've got to take the veil off um, to see the glory of what's being said and the way the veil is removed is Christ, okay? Okay. Now, the other thing we've talked about is we've talked about how in Christian tradition, I mean, how it's been, how this has been laid out for centuries is there are four ways to read Scripture. And they're all simultaneously valid. The first way is the natural reading, is what you could say, well, what was Paul trying to communicate? Who was he talking to? Or why was this story of David written down? What was the purpose of writing this story down? That's kind of the natural reading of it. And it's, it's an important reading. You, we need to know exactly, we need to have an idea of why it was written and who it was written to and, and the purpose of it. But and context too, right? Yeah, and that would all be context. Yeah, the time, the historical setting, what was going on socially, economically, politically. Why did they write this story down? Why did they say this? But then there are three spiritual readings which are not, are not tethered to that natural reading. And those three spiritual readings are, I, see, I say way to think about it is metaphor, moral, and mystical, if you want to use all the alliteration of M's, right? Or you could say allegory instead of metaphor to turn, to turn Scripture into an allegory. Or you could, instead of the moral sense of it, you could say a kind of spirit-led sense that of ought. What do you feel called to do out of this text? That's the moral of it. It's kind of an ethical reading. Ethics has to do with, well, what do I do now? Well, the ethical reading is, so what do I do with the story of David? Is it just a historical story about something that happened to a guy who became king of Israel long, long ago? Or is there some urging for me? an ethical reading, a moral reading. And then the mystical or the contemplative reading is in all scripture, we should have a sense of God's infinite love and care for us. 
that's the contemplative reading, is that you imagine, yes, and I am so loved by God, even if the specific text may not even be addressing that, that's the frame in which we always read it. This is somehow a communication from a very loving, infinitely patient, kind, generous father who wants the best for me. That's the contemplative mystical reading, okay? So, this morning in my meditation, I gave us a metaphorical reading of 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. I didn't give us the natural reading. I referenced what the natural reading was. What was the natural reading? Like probably what John actually meant when he wrote it in his letter. You remember what I said, the natural? I didn't say, it. this is a natural reading, folks. No. But I basically was saying that at the beginning. That we don't know, but we'll know what it's like. And we will be like. Yeah, in the second coming, right? So if you go back to chapter 2, verse 28, just previous, it becomes to me more explicit that he's talking about the second coming of Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 20, 28, Now little children abide in him so that when he appears, which is the same thing he talks about when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. So he's urging, he's urging these Christians to try and live holy lives, to try and emulate Jesus, to love their brothers because God is love, love their brothers and sisters, all these things because we're looking forward to the day in which Jesus will appear. He will come again. And we don't want to be ashamed and go, well, I wasn't very loving all this time you were gone, <laughs> right? You want to be able to say, oh, now the one appearing is who I've been longing for and trying to be like. That's his urging, right? Does that make sense? You follow? That's the natural reading. Is he's, he's talking about Jesus' end time appearing, and then we'll know who we will be because we will see him as he is and we will have been striving. Even in chapter 3, today's reading, the part that I didn't really emphasize, um, like verse 5, of, now I'm in chapter 3, you know that he appeared, that's his first coming, the incarnation, his ministry, he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin, right? No one who abides in him sins, no one who sins has seen him or known him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous. So here's the urging. The first time he appeared, it was to take away sin. So we should be then trying to rid ourselves of these sinful practices and living just wantonly in it because he will appear again. See, he's got his first appearing was born of Mary. His second appearing is when he's going to come and then we'll see him as he is. That's the natural reading. But I totally, like, left that and did something else in the meditation, right? I turned, I turned Jesus or, or John's words in verse 2 into a metaphor about the topography of our relationship with Christ. Like, it's, it's nature. How is it that we relate to Christ? Knowing what John meant, probably in the way he wrote it to the people he was writing to, but I didn't emphasize the second coming. I emphasized how he comes to us constantly every day. He appears and we become like him. Now, do you see how that is a metaphorical reading that is not grounded in the natural reading of this verse? But it's a very true reading. Right, because none of us would say, "Well, that doesn't happen," you know. Well, yeah, it does happen. That's exactly what happens. Uh, we know that Christ does appear, and that's why I went to Matthew and you know tied some other threads together where he says, "When you did it to the least of these, you did it to me." So I'm standing on firm ground. You know, it's not like I'm making something up that's foreign to Scripture. But what I suggested out of verse 2 was a metaphorical reading based on other things from the whole reading of Scripture, that we know Jesus is coming to us in our neighbor, and therefore, in that sense, he appears to us then, 
and then we can be like him in how we respond to our neighbor. But that was a metaphorical reading. That was a spiritual reading of that verse, not a natural reading of the verse. So I don't know. Is that you you tracking with the difference? Yeah, it, it, if if a person, yeah. See, I know some people would object to what I said because they would say a careful textual reading, the grammatical historical reading is you've interpreted it incorrectly because there's one interpretation that it has to do with the second coming. They, they would say that's not what John was trying to say. And I would agree with them. Yeah, I'm not saying what John was trying to say when he said that. I'm saying something more that is spiritually true that is a, an additional level of meaning in this text. Yeah. But, yeah. And, yeah, you could you go back to, yeah, you could go to Jesus' statement in John, which is John again, right? If you want to know the authority by which I, you know, say and do these things, then then try it out is what Jesus' challenge is. Just try it out and then you will know. You got to live it to know it, right? I don't know. So does that raise other questions or comments? Um, You commented that all of us are spiritually pure in some areas of our lives, neighboring, I would say, <laughs> it ebbs and flows, doesn't it? <laughs> my poverty either waxes and wanes depending on what's going on, my spiritual poverty. Yeah, but see, when I was saying those things and drawing those points out, that's not literally at all what John was saying, right? But we recognize that as being personally true in our experience. We know that happens, right? We sense that, right? Right? And so what I was trying to do is draw out some other meanings that are more of the spiritual interpretation of the text rather than a literal interpretation of the text. And that's, that's exactly what Christian history is filled with, is people doing that, right? Okay. It's almost like the, the, the scriptures are a, a mosaic. You know, it's, it's what the creator Yeah, and that's why we would say that's that's why we say these words are inspired. I wouldn't do that with an uninspired text. You better just stick to what the author meant. But an inspired text that's inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit meant more than John meant when he wrote it. Does that make sense? It's not like I'm making up intentions. John had in mind what he was saying to Christians, and that was of course, one thing, I'm trying to communicate this truth to them. But because it's being authored by the Holy Spirit, we shouldn't be shocked to, to realize, oh, there's other meanings impregnated in these words that weren't ever in the mind of John. So my task is not what did John mean, but what did the Spirit mean? I, it's helpful to know exactly what John was trying to do in that day and time, but it's also possible to say, and how does this reflect an overall way in which I relate to Christ, right? Now, we do this all the time. In fact, we've always done this in church. And when I talked about the story of, of David and Goliath, I asked the question, so how was that story interpreted to you? Well, we all had Goliaths that in our lives, you know, things that we thought were impossible to defeat, and we needed to be like David. There's a moral. We need to be like David and trust in God that despite the looming enemy of whatever we're facing, it can be defeated by faith. We're allegorizing that story. And even though I, you know, even though we might have grown up in a church which never talked about we need to read Scripture in that way, we actually did it. We had, you, you needed to do that. 
because the story about David and Goliath is not about an ancient conflict between two people on a battlefield thousands of years ago. It has spiritual meaning about our battlefields and our struggles, right? So we've actually always done this to some degree. And part of what we can realize is we can do this not just with some stories, but we actually ought to read all of it asking those kinds of questions, looking for how everything can be related to the way I relate to Christ. Now, Ken, you had a... of the time would you say you brought is this something you're doing more than you did five years ago is this something that yes you're, you're <laughs> more than two years ago i'm just just i'd just like to hear a little bit personal yeah thing. well okay confession um <laughs> I tend to just, I tend to be an early adopter of whatever seems to be. Like, if I sense that, that this is something and it's new to me, I go ahead and share it with you. I don't wait three years to figure out what does this mean. I try and like, I think it needs to be shared, right? So you're on the same adventure I'm on, right? You know, no, I was absolutely trained to ask the questions, what was the author's original intent That was exegesis. Hermeneutics was, well, how do you then interpret this for your audience? What did it mean and what does it mean? But what does it mean for your people you're speaking to is some application of what it did mean. So I was not at all given the the kind of training that says, read things allegorically, read things in the spiritual register. So, yeah, it's something that I've been doing more and more. And I wouldn't say, like like I've said, we were actually doing that long time ago in in little country churches that you grew up. If you grew up in a little country church and you think, well, you know, our, our preacher didn't even go to, you know, any sort of Bible college or anything. You know, he was just, but he was probably still doing that, right? We We were doing that. Now we're just kind of pulling it, pulling back and realizing we were doing that, and that's a healthy thing to do, right? So I'm definitely doing it more, or at least I'm aware, perhaps more aware in the last five, ten years of how this really needs to affect the way we read Scripture, reading it differently. And part of it's listening to people who do read it differently, right? So when Jesus says, I'll be with you always, and he says and you'll have the poor with you always, th- that's making a metaphorical, that's making a kind of spiritual connection between those two statements, not a literal one, you know. But then then it's to realize maybe Matthew intended for us, he, he had no idea we wouldn't read it spiritually and we wouldn't see the similarity in phrases and go, I see, I see the connection you're making, Matthew. In other words, what we might not realize is Matthew is often making these connections and the, sim- the, symbol- the symbolism of what he's saying, how it functions symbolically. And we didn't realize he's gesturing towards that. He wants us to realize that because he was in a world where everyone did that. And so he didn't know that 2,000 years later, people wouldn't know how to read him in that kind of manner, if that makes sense. Yeah. Carolyn? It occurred to me as you were mentioning um, the battle of Goliath and David that David used what he had to fight a battle. Okay. And that kind of been concentrating on this week as being, I already have what I need. And so I have been told that. Yeah. Do do I believe it or not? See? Yeah. Exactly. See, that's a see, that's a good metaphorical reading of the story, saying he already knew he had a sling and he knew how to do that. And so is the spiritual emphasis is, is it that the Holy Spirit is equipping you? It's not like I need something outside of what the Holy Spirit's given me. So so that's a that's I think a very good spiritual reading. So the message is, yes, you are already equipped. 
You don't have to wear the armor of Goliath to fight Goliath. What you need is to rely on what resources you have been given. See, I think that's a very good spiritual reading of the text. Right. Yeah, so, so we, we bring in all the conflict language in Scripture that needs to be heard in light of Paul's statement that we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So now every, every conflict story is not about people living there, those other people. We start realizing every conflict account like David and Goliath has to be read as a spiritual, yeah, my Goliath is not another person or group of people. My Goliath is, is a spiritual problem. But that's, yeah, that's what Paul's saying. It's not against flesh and blood. Any seeing the text is telling me those are your enemies, those human beings, and you need to fight against them is not reading the text well. It's always a spiritual problem um, that then we, we see, we look for. Exactly, yeah. Daryl? Jesus talks about the, the scriptures as being talking about him. Mm-hmm. Now, if you actually took it literally, you could find a few prophetic things that point to him that say, okay, yeah, that may be him. But if that's true what he's saying, the only way to actually I guess, reconcile that is to have that a metaphorical, spiritual way of understanding the stories relating to Christ. Exactly, yeah. Otherwise, you've got a 95, 99% would be not about him. Right. If, if the only parts in the Old Testament are about Jesus are the prophetic parts, you're right. That's a very small percentage of the total verses. But I think what Jesus is saying is all of it can be understood as me because I am the one in whom you relate to God. And all of it is about people attempting to relate to God. So it's all about Christ bringing us into relationship with the Father. Right? Okay, well, let's play a little bit with an easy one. Let's play with um, the story of Joseph. Greg, don't we have to be a little careful, though, because don't you think the prosperity gospel has sort of taken that thing and used it in cancel it? Oh, yeah, there can be any number of poor readings of Scripture, right? So, uh, but poor readings of Scripture come from a poor understanding of God to begin with. Because if it's all about Christ, it is all about Christ. And if you think Christ embodies health and wealth, well, then you're going to make it all about Christ. But my point would be Christ is all about health and wealth. I mean, geez, you know, the guy who had nowhere to lay his head, you know, the guy who suffers on the cross. So there's my disconnect with, with the, but you're right. But there's no, there's no there's no way, well, if we read Scripture this way, it can't be misread. Oh, Scripture can be misread no matter how you read it, right? So it's not like, well, if we read it this way, we're more liable to misread it. Oh, no, believe me, everyone's, you know, our abilities to misread it are legendary. So, so reading it metaphorically is not increasing the risk. It actually might be, to me, diminishing the risk because you have to relate it to an overall overarching narrative. Right? I can't just kind of pull this piece out. Either it fits into the overarching narrative or it doesn't. So that's why you have to start with Christ. Who is Christ? Christ is God and, huma- and, and the human completely united and expressing love, mercy, kindness, forgiveness, without vengeance, without violence. That's who Christ is. Is that really debatable? Anyone want to allege that's not who Christ is? You start with that picture of Christ, meek, gentle, humble, right? And and then you read everything from that viewpoint. I actually think we'll end up with less poor readings of Scripture, ironically. But but I, yeah, there's no there's no panacea for poor readings of Scripture. <laughs> yeah. Got the visible that brought them to life way for 
what I'm saying? Yeah. What, you know, here's a study in this book relating it to this lesson. Or going to a, you know, men's business breakfast, and then, you know, Christian men's business breakfast, and they pull out some Old Testament narrative and just be wild with this. You can get just a narrative to do for being a better business partner. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the dangers exist, right? But I think when we're tethered truly to the person of Jesus as our starting point, and again, I don't think it's that hard to have an overarching view of who Jesus is, then we critique any reading which does not express the selflessness of Christ who goes to the cross loving his enemies. Okay, now now spin it a different way. Right? Everything is about that. Okay, but let's play with... let's. Play, you got something, Alan? Well, I, you know, I think it's everybody's personal journey. It's the valley you're in where you, where maybe Jesus loves you differently. Yeah. Um, clearly, but part of it, I'm trying to think about all of those examples. If you're making uh, alliterations, allegorical, uh, other types and allegories of scripture, then is it all boiled down to mercy and love. So it's, if you're <laughs> looking at Jesus and you're saying mercy, so I was sort of thinking, okay, well, David is sort of the, the Jesus figure, you know, that's showing mercy and love. And so then I thought, well, and I couldn't find it, so I was distracting my brain too, was with David and Goliath, they were the champions, right? So they averted the war at that point by David and King Goliath, or is that not true? Because they went back and danced because David had killed Goliath. Yeah, but I but we even have to get away from the fact that David is killing another human being. Well, my, 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 my point is, if you look at it in the allegorical, yes. David killed Goliath. It was mercy because you didn't have a hundred thousand people dead on the battlefield that particular time. Yeah. Yeah. And so, the more I think, yeah. you know, when you talk about poor in spirit, and then just you know your own journey go through it. There's there's poor in health. That's a, a moment where you, know, you have compassion. Then, so I, I thought about this today, um, you know, with the uh, Make a Wish. Mm. Um, you know, again, it's one of those things where they came from it. Um, now I'm having the name uh, down. Terry. Terry. Hello. Yeah. Mercy. Yeah, it blessed their family with their special needs son. They got a wish, and that's what. She, yeah, no, that, that that's right. Some sort of way in which we identify then elicits the compassion and mercy. Yeah, but like with the David and Goliath story, I think you have to set aside the fact that he's killing another human being because what what if I'm starting with Jesus. There's no reason to kill another human being for any reason at all that I can see. Not with Christ, because he doesn't do it, right? And he doesn't say, I can do it. So, but once I turn Goliath into a figure of that which actually is threatening, you know, society or threatening lives or threatening peace, well, then it is to be a peacemaker is to kill the, the Goliath, right? To, to be merciful is to destroy the, the source of what will plague people. So go, the Goliath story becomes a story about defeating the enemy of the people. And Jesus is David and Goliath is the devil who, who tempts us and gets us into sin. I mean, you can read it that way and say, yeah, yeah, it's not ever saying, well, under certain circumstances, it's okay for you to kill someone. No, I, it, it's not okay. Um, right, right. He, and it completely under unjust, unwarranted circumstances, he allows that to happen, and he doesn't take vengeance. And when he rises from the dead, he doesn't go do payback then. <laughs> he just, he, right. There's still a, a loss, a sacrifice. Yes. Yeah, it's it's the. It's a form of slight. I mean, 
rejoicing in slaying your enemies. Right. So we have to read those differently. In light of Christ, mm-hmm. I don't see. I don't think Christ ever says rejoice in the death of others. But even like he. Is Ezekiel 34 is like the last verse says God does not take um, God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. I mean, is is that revelatory? Um, yes, it is, and it will be seen in Jesus who takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Maybe the death of wickedness, but not of the wicked. The death of wickedness is people freed from from their sin. That's okay. But let's let's play a little bit. Forgive them, right? Okay, so let's let's do a little bit with the story of Joseph. So we're familiar with Joseph. So how would we start turning the story of Joseph into an allegory about Jesus? Which Joseph? Joseph, son of Jacob, next to youngest brother, whose youngest bro- younger brother was Benjamin. How do you turn that in? How is he in? A Jesus type figure. Okay, yes. He's innocent and he's unfairly accused time and time again, right? His brothers, you know, but then Potiphar's wife. So he's always the one who's uh, who's being sinned against, right? Okay. He was long awaited. He was long awaited, yes. Yes, he's the child kind of a promise. Yeah, they're waiting for a Messiah. You know, he's that kind of figure. He's, you know, it was, it was Jacob's desire to have a child with the wife, what Rachel, that he dearly loved, you know, that his father-in-law had swindled him into <laughs> marrying her sister for, you know. So, yeah, there's that whole aspect. What else? When he became powerful, he, he gave mercy. When he sits on his throne, having come into his glory, he forgives his brothers, which is just what Jesus does on the cross, right? The brothers come up, oh, and then they find out, oh, no, he's now in charge. Boy, are we going to get it. No, you know, you're all forgiven. Go get the family. Come back. You know, this is all for your blessing. Even though you're guilty, I forgive you, right? He's a Christ figure. He... When he's reigning on his throne, he's forgiving, which is what Jesus is doing from the cross when he's reigning on his throne. He came back from the dead. Yes. He came back from the dead. And where did they throw him? Where did his brothers throw him? Was it not a well? He went down into a well, yeah, which is kind of water, and then he was raised up. He was reborn. There's kind of an image of baptism, right? He was thrown down in a well and he was raised. But he died. I mean, they told his father he's dead. So in some ways, he dies and is resurrected, right? No, not literally. We're not saying literally. We're we're saying you can allegorize the story of Joseph, right? It's like he's he dies and he's resurrected. Then he he ends up reigning on his throne from which he forgives all those who put him to death, which is his and brothers. He was defeated. I mean, it seemed like it was a lost cause. Yes. But he came back even more powerful. Yeah. And he yeah. He's, yeah, he's sold into slavery, but then becomes the one who defeats the slavery, right? Yeah, he does. He does. Well, he recognized him. Yeah. yeah, they didn't recognize the risen, the risen Joseph, right? They didn't know it was him. Kind of like disciples post-resurrection. Yeah. He trusted God's voice even when it took courage. Yes, e- e- even when it didn't make much sense to do that, right? Right. What about some of his dreams? That's what I was referring to. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I was thinking even, even if I were to make analogies out of the content of his dreams, it's interesting that he interpreted the dreams of a baker and a cupbearer, bread and cup. Hmm. His, his kind of thrown down into the well by his brothers and raised up is kind of baptism and yet 
you have this imagery of bread and cup, right? But then even what about the dream of the seven lean years and then the seven years of plenty? I mean, you could, you could say, is that not analogous to often our journey, spiritual journey is struggle, but there is reward and blessing and, and abundance to come? I mean, yeah, you could say that, right? The struggle comes before the blessing. Just like sometimes we have to struggle through things before we come to new understandings that bless us. So even that kind of has that flavor to it. Does that make sense? Now, what we're seeing is you could do many, many allegorical stories about Joseph and make them all about Christ and our spiritual life in Christ, with Christ, Christ over us, how, how we journey spiritually, and they would all be appropriate. We would be reading that all of this has to do with Christ. Even if we don't make Joseph the Christ figure, if I make myself Joseph and I say, but sometimes I get falsely accused and sometimes, you know, I get thrown into kind of a prison, as it were, uh, unjustly, yet God is with me. I'm still making it about Christ because I'm saying that kind of journey is one that occurs when we're following Christ. Sometimes you're like Joseph and Potiphar's wife accuses you and, and other people hold you guilty, but little do they know. I mean, surely we've had those kinds of experiences, right? <laughs> you know, the, the allegory is still about how my spiritual life plays out with Christ, even if I'm not making Joseph the Christ figure, even if I'm saying I'm Joseph in this case, or maybe I'm the brothers coming to Joseph and feeling, right, shame and guilt, and surely now he's going to wreak his vengeance, and then hearing forgiveness. That's, that's my journey, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, is, is that, I don't know if that's helping. That's be reading the story as a metaphor. Then you could draw various morals out of it. I need to be more willing to forgive or to trust that God's working in inscrutable circumstances or somehow if I'll just stay faithful that later I will see how this is, transpiring, you know, I could draw any number of morals, like what I need to do based on reading this metaphorically, and then you could read it contemplatively, and, and you, could, you could just sit back and say, if this story is kind of a paradigm, yes, the, the loving father is always present, and I, I can be in his embrace no matter what's going on and where I am, right? You can, you can sit mystically with the, with the text. And that would be the three spiritual readings. And what we got to remember is we could do that and we each have a different little reading and that's okay because what you hear and are moved by someone else hears something different and they're moved by that and that's the working of the Holy Spirit because we're reading an inspired text that is not just a text that was inspired but is still being inspired in the sense that I just don't read words on a page. I read these words, these words read me, and the Spirit then prompts me and works within me as I'm reading them, maybe to realize something I need to do differently or to realize I'm incredibly loved. I'm feeling I'm feeling persecuted like Joseph, mistreated and thrown into a well and then sold into slavery. And, you know, and maybe what prompts me is, but God is with you, just like he was Joseph. See, and I go away with that message, but you go away with a completely different message. This is totally appropriate, right? You know, there's not one message that we all need to share in common. There's one reading that it's all about Christ and our, our lives with Christ. That's a common one, but how that plays out can have as many different nuances as there are people in this room, the nuance of their own life at this moment.
that making sense? Yeah. yeah. That's all. That's all we're talking about. Yeah. One thing that strike me: Am I right to say I have to know about Jesus to identify this scripture is about him? Well, to yeah, to we have to know Jesus before we start reading the scriptures. So people who read the scriptures when Jesus was here would not have a way of making that connection. Paul didn't. I mean, think about Paul. He'd be prime example. He read those scriptures. He knew those scriptures. And what did he do? Set out to persecute the followers of Jesus, thinking he had absolutely understood the meaning of the text. And he had completely misunderstood the meaning of the text. That's why... No. No, see, that, that's, why, that's, why Paul, that's why Paul can say, a veil is over them when they read it. Because he knows it was over him when he read it. And he says it is only removed in Christ. He can't read scripture well until he gets his whole world turned upside down on the road to Damascus. Then he starts going back and guess what? Reading scripture differently. Because now he knows Christ is true. Now what in the heck was I doing with all these scriptures? Which I justified imprisoning and killing Christians about. Now if I know Christ is true, what in the world do these scriptures mean now? He says the veil was gone and he started to understand them in a completely different way. That's what we have to realize. The same thing goes with us. It's not like, well, that was, his, that was reality back then, but it's not reality today. No, no, no. It's, it's always the human reality. Greg, can you say that in a backward way that given where this church started and those who there was a lack of understanding at, uh, where we began the uh, people that came up with the rule based uh, interpretation I'm, I'm not saying that's bad or anything. well the, the story is always we're in a place of misunderstanding and we're moving towards greater understanding I would say that's always the story right? and once I reach it, you know the analogy of, of peeling the onion. You know, once you take off one layer of an onion, well, there's another layer underneath. And you take off that, and there's another layer underneath. That's a principle that's true of spiritual things. Once you address one sin and think, I've addressed my sin, guess what? You'll become aware of another sin <laughs> underneath. It's final yeah, it's, it's an ongoing process. So, yes. We started 20 years ago as a group thinking about Scripture in a particular way, thinking about the gospel in a certain way. And I hope we've peeled the onion some, but this is not to say we're not still needing to peel the onion, right? Uh, so the only question is the changing nature of our misunderstanding. See, I, just, I find that the false Scripture in the church in general, and that it's been rules-based. What? Well, and I've been rules-based... Yeah, I've been rules-based in the past. It's, it's still a long journey of letting go of being rules-based. Because some, yeah, it's just the nature of the journey. Yeah. So it's an ongoing Yeah, but, thing. you know, they, they, they put a stake in the ground. This is the answer. Yeah. And if I do that, I'm, I've yeah. made a mistake. Right. Yeah. If I do that, anytime I drive a stake down and say, and here's where we stay, yeah. rather than, and what does God have in store next? Yeah. I think that's the posture. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll stop there for today. And <coughs> thank you for your comments and thoughts. Yeah, we got all the two